the organizers for taking on this challenging subject. There's so much misperception, I would say, on Sharia. And before I begin to all the Muslim participants, I would say Ramadan Kareem. And the holy month is beginning now. Yet you have these people who came here despite the challenges. And uh, there are few people I would like to acknowledge, especially His Excellency Dr. Hans Korel, uh, the former Under Secretary General of the UN, uh, on legal affairs. And uh, he's studied the Quran and he's done much work in this field. Uh, you'll hear some of the comments which I will refer to in a little while. There are several others here also. And uh, what we would do is, I would briefly introduce the panelists at the up front right now. I'll mention a few statistics which have been brought to my knowledge. Mm. Then I will ask the panelists some questions. And hopefully the panelists will ask each other some questions. And we'll open it up for dialogue. The idea is there's nobody here who's with any prepared text or prepared speech. So this is a very participatory session. And we want to encourage that same format which the World Justice Forum constantly engages in. So let me begin by introducing the panelists here. Dr. Mazia Davidi Mazia, I think now you don't she doesn't need an introduction. You just heard her speak so passionately on the Tunisian experience. But she's a writer, professor, Islamic scholar. Among other positions, she's the founder of the Islamic Center. Oh sorry, sorry. I started with Dr. Mahid Mullah. <laughs> I said, what happened here? <laughs> so maybe those are new challenges here. <laughs> those are things which you have to pursue. See, I, he, I've known Dr. Mullah for many years. And somehow, even if I have a paper in front of me, I just gravitate to you, Dr. Mullah. <laughs> so, okay, she's the first president of the Second Constituent Assembly of Tunisia. She has been the president of the Global Women of Faith Network since 2006. She is expert on issues related to women, religion and society. And she has experience of being a member of the European Council of Religious Leaders on her record. Then I have Dr. Bahij Mullah. He is a writer, professor and Islamic scholar. Among his other positions, he is a member of the Islamic Center of Spain. He is also the General Secretary of the Islamic Council in Spain. He has been working and publishing various books and articles on Quranic sciences, Hadith, and Sharia law in different languages. He originally from Syria and Saudi Arabia, but now based in Spain. Uh, then to his right, we have Dr. Muhammad Ziaul Haq. He is a Dean of Faculty of Sharia and Law in International Islamic University in Islamabad, Pakistan. His specialization is in comparative international Islamic law, interfaith relations in Islamic law, interfaith dialogue, and human rights in Islamic perspective. He has been teaching Islamic law in various universities around the world. He also published a range of books and articles on related issues. To the extreme left here is Dr. Mahmoud Hekmatmiya. He is an Iranian scholar and associate professor of Islamic Research Institute for Culture and Thought in the field of philosophy of legal system and civil law. Several times he was selected as top researcher of the year in Iran and recently his three volumes of books the Comprehensive System of Women's Rights is nominated. He wrote and published more than 11 books in Islamic legal system. These will be your speakers. I am Bawa Jain. I, serve, I will serve as the moderator, as a facilitator. Uh, I, I serve as the founding secretary of the World Council of Religious Leaders. And our focus is on religious diplomacy. And one of the challenges here for the forum was, can Islam and Sharia law be harmonized with mainstream law? And that's one of the questions we will ask our panelists. But I just want to tell you a couple of statistics which I brought to my knowledge. One is that from uh, the Pew Research, and this is just amazing, they interviewed some 38,000 Muslims in 39 countries. And what they overwhelmingly found was 83% of Muslims want Sharia enshrined in law. Now, uh, if you know by statistics, there are about 1.5 billion Muslims in the world. You can imagine that 83% of them want Sharia to be enshrined in mainstream law. That's a challenge. How would that happen? Can it be harmonized? Another thing which I found uh, struck me was the often misunderstood question of role of women in Sharia. 
and there's a strong participation of women here. I'm sure you will have. What I read on this was that Islam does not prohibit women from working, but emphasizes the importance of housekeeping and caring for the families of both parents. It goes on to expand that. I have some questions about that. Are women's roles just restricted to housekeeping and caring for the families in this day and age, especially in Western secular societies, in democracies? Because at the same time, they also mention that the Prophet, peace be upon him, his wife Aisha, took part in politics as a major authority on the Hadith. So that's a challenge to me. So I want to understand a bit more from our scholars on that subject. We will come to that. We will just come to that. I am just going to introduction. And we will certainly, that is one of the first questions I have on top. There was another part which struck me. I just read this out to you. Islamic law is very different from English common law or the European civil law traditions. Muslims are bound to the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, whose translation of Allah or God's will is found in the Quran. Muslims are held accountable to the Sharia law, but non-Muslims are not bound by the same standard. Muslims and non-Muslims are both required to live by laws enacted by the various forms of government, such as tax laws, traffic laws, crimes, business and theft. These are many other, uh, these are many other crimes similar to common law crimes are, trend, are tried in modern Muslim courts. The Muslim courts can also hear civil law family law and all other cases. Islamic law does not have separate court for Muslims for religious crimes and contemporary non-religious courts for the similar criminal and civil matters. I raise these more as questions because our goal is that if through this session we can raise more questions than answers, I think we would have succeeded. Dr. Hans Korel, you know, he mentioned in his paper uh, a clarification really. A highly misleading, it's highly misleading to suggest that Islamic law is constituted by the Quran and the tradition of, of the Prophet, peace be upon him, without further recourse to techniques of juristic analysis. So there's a misnomer that Sharia is intrinsically linked to the Quran, whereas researchers and scholars will tell you that it is not. So that's something which we will also raise with the panel. Then, the other part which he, I liked about our Dr. Correll's paper was he then goes into the religious side, he goes to the, the golden rule and he quotes from the different traditions on the concept of law and it's pretty universal. The same concept come in which is often misunderstood. Having said that, I just wanted to raise a few questions on this subject. And as we heard in the morning, we were asking what is the definition of law? And uh, your sister here just says what is the definition of Sharia? Because the misconceptions of Sharia. So my first question, let me begin with you Dr. Mullah is, what is Sharia? Uh, you are talking about traditional law. Really, Sharia is not a traditional law. It is original and genuine law. Because the law in, uh, in Arabia at that time it was of the dominant forces. There, there was no law, not written law, not oral law. So, the Sharia, it is not a traditional one. Second thing, the Sharia, is the law of Muslims in Islamic State, not the law of the Islamic State. Why? Because in an Islamic State, there is Muslims and non-Muslims. It is very important, this point, that it is for the Muslims, except in civil, uh, civil rights, so I mean civil law. Why we say that? Because Sharia uh, is uh, has been constituted by four elements, principal elements. First, uh, worship. 
Biz de böyle umut alıyoruz demiş. Ben de tövbe almamız. Second, it also uh, has a system of ethics and moral. This is something of social accepted. Third thing is the civil law, you know, common law. This is, well, this part is belong to Muslims and non-Muslims in this Islamic state. Of course, uh, when we talk about uh, worshipping, the others, the non-Muslims, has nothing to do. It's part of Sharia. When we talk about Islamic uh, moral system, also it is not belong to them, but there is a moral, uh, public morals that they have to respect in every way. Uh, when we talk also about the uh, civil law, of course, this is common for all. But on the other hand, uh, Sharia uh, it's, uh, has been constituted by four other elements in other time. One is a written, written uh, code that which has been revelated by God textually in the Quran. The second one is the oral law, this which has been declared by Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a normative, as a normative law. These two parts, these two parts, we can call them to cover the original part of Sharia or the inefficient of the law. Inefficient of the The third one, the third element, uh, is the organic law. This is changing from time to time. But it is part of Sharia. And the fourth one uh, is the positive law. Because we think that the intelligence and the, uh, the human uh, has dis discovered new things. This discovery, we have to accept it inside the Sharia if it is not in contradiction with the uh, basis of the Sharia. Uh, can, we, can we talk about yeah. that? Okay. Thank you. Let me just turn to Dr. Hek Matniya because uh, as you mentioned earlier, there's a difference between the Shias and Sunnis on Sharia. Can you please speak a little to that? Before I I want to define Sharia in short. Just what? Uh, Sharia is based upon the will of God as a legislator from uh, and derived from valid sources such as Quran and Hadith and with certain methodology of unfair rules governing people's behavior. <coughs> the methodology of unfair names Usul al fiqh Part of these rules are having appropriate remedies and sanctions constitutes Islamic legal system. That means Islamic legal systems is uh, shorter than Sharia. Sharia is uh, really basically. The rules of this legal system can be included in six categories. The rule determining rights and duties. For example, the rule the property of the person is respected. Or you shall not steal. This is one part of Sharia. Two, the enforcement rules of the first categories. For example, when someone damages one's property, is obliged, recover or the thief to be sanctioned. Three, the rules concerning the qualified person to admit determining these duties and authorities, for example, judges and rulers. 
in Sharia there are some uh, proposition about the rulers, judges, the sifat, the objectives of the person who can be judges in the court. For rulers concerning evidence and judicial procedures. Five rulers concerning the enforcement process. And the six rulers concerning how to behave the person after enforcement of rules upon him. This uh, kind of rulers in Sharia. You ask me what uh, difference between Sunni and Shia in Sharia. You know that Sunni and Shia uh, have uh, some uh, same parts. For example, uh, both of them behave that the will of God is the foundation of Sharia. The methodology of it is usul al uh, And the institution, the words, the methodology is the same. But some have different views about the sources of the world. Most of them believe that the Quran is the uh, first sources of law. And this is a uh, uh, revelation of God to Prophet Muhammad And the second, the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad is the base uh, and the same uh, and the, both of them is the same. But the interpreter, the interpreter of uh, Sunnah, she believes that the uh, 12 Imams are uh, interpreted of Wah, uh, and this is a legal valid uh, sources of law. And uh, about ra uh, Russian uh, is the same. Uh, but and in Ijma, Ijma, the view of consists consensus. Consensus. Ijma but the means of Ijma is different between Sunni and Shia. Uh, because uh, Shia believes that uh, when Ijma is valid, one uh, Imam among the ulama that uh, have Ijma on something. But the sonnet doesn't believe it. And some uh, sources of law that um, different between Sunni and Shia. For example, Piyas. Analogy. Yeah. Thinking by analogy. Shia thinking that some analogy of Yas is valid. Uh, very uh, little. Yeah, uh, but this is different. And the Estehsan and other sources of law, this is different and different uh, between Shia and Sunni and between Sunni. Uh, and some other uh, sources. All of the sources that can be discussed between ulama in Islam, uh, 23 or 24 sources. One and two, Quran and uh, 
from that is uh, every baby uh, but in the other sources is different between Shia and Sunni and between the Sunni. Okay. Now I just want to turn uh, to Dr. Haq briefly. I know you studied in Glasgow. A few years ago, the Archbishop of Canterbury came out and stated that uh, perhaps in Britain, Sharia law should also be uh, implemented, practiced. And there was a furor, and they nearly crucified him for that. He had to suffer a lot of consequences. So I want to ask you, do you think that two parallel forms of law can be implemented and practiced in a secular society, in a democracy in the Western world? First of all, I would like to uh, explain that this is in, this is not the demand, this is actually existing. And there are several cases in which the Brit British court, they have given decisions on the basis of the rulings of Sharia, particularly where there is a conflict of law. The sensitivity about Sharia is too much because some of the extremist groups, they are using the terminology of Sharia for their vested interest. And therefore, whenever the name of Sharia is coming to discuss, it came, yeah, it, it is attacked, unfortunately, with the extremism. This already, in the world, there are different legal systems, American legal system, French legal system, British legal system. Within the Europe, several legal systems are working. And we have ancient legal system, for example, Roman legal system. But when we are talking about Islamic legal system, the sensitivity arises. Actually, if we go into the theories of law, we have traditionally uh, natural law theory, and then we have positive law theory. If we look into Islamic jurisprudence, we will find that Islamic jurisprudence is the combination of the positive as well as natural law theory. Islamic law is also every legal system of the world is dealing with three things. It provides obligations, <coughs> it declares perhaps, and it provides option. The same is in Islamic legal system. Actually, the problem that we are facing presently, that extreme Muslims, they like to establish that Sharia is the superior law on all other legal systems and Sharia law is divine itself and the extreme seculars within Muslim societies are outside Muslim societies they are trying to establish that Sharia law has no value and Sharia law is outdated and unhuman and this situation has created a challenge for the Muslim societies particularly Muslim societies which are started new process of the legislation. They like to have modern legislation, modern constitutions, but at the same time they like to base on their tradition. Like every civilization, every society has the right to have legislation on the basis of their norms and their tradition and their faith. This is the right of the Muslims. We have the experience of its experience in Pakistan and the same type of experience is going to be held in Tunisia. Actually, the time is that there should be efforts to bridge the gap between common law and Sharia law. I became dean of my faculty and my faculty was established when General Ziaul Haq, he started process of legislation, Islamization in Pakistan. At that time, one objective of the faculty was to establish the superiority of Sharia on the common law. Later on, we thought that this is not the appropriate strategy. We changed it. We made it try to bridge the gap between Sharia and common law and try to harmonization both the legal system that can serve to the Muslim society. So therefore, there are values of Islamic law which can be utilized by the human societies, all human societies and it has been happened in the British society. Any British jurisprudence itself is influenced from 
Islamic jurisprudence, procedural law of the Britain is also influenced from the Adab al Qazi, procedural law of Islam. There is a process of assimilation, there is a process of adoption and adaptation among the world legal system. Islamic law do have some influence from the Justinian court. Justinian was the king of the Rome and he died 100 before the birth of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And uh, it was implemented in many areas of the Arab where later on Islamic law came. So Islamic law has not to be treated as a separate law of the extremist. It has to be treated as a well-established legal system as we have Roman legal system, Greek legal, legal system, French legal system and British, British legal system. And you know one of the one of the trends I think one we have to also watch is why the statistics being compiled now. By 2050, the majority of Europe is going to be Muslim. These are just facts, they are facts. And if there are contradiction in mainstream law and practice of Sharia, what are we heading into? Where does this go? From your experience, I want to bring you out of Tunisia into Europe. I lived in Europe. That's why. I lived here 25 years in, uh, in France. Indeed, you may ask yourself what a politician has to do with explaining Sharia. Indeed, before being a politician, I'm a translator. Translated, special, specialized in legal text, Islamic legal texts. So I'm a good friend of scholars, of Muslim scholars, and uh, from time to time I thwart them with my questions. So, uh, I, I never forget that I'm a woman, so <laughs> I ask a lot of questions about Sharia. Anyway, uh, one of the founding books I translated in France about Sharia is the book written by uh, Sheikh Abdel Wahab Khalaf, uh, The Founding Principles of Islamic Law. And uh, in doing this translation for two years, of course, with the team, uh, I uh, became more familiar with the content of the Sharia and the relationship between Sharia and law in general and human heritage, legal human heritage. And I realized also the logic of Sharia. Of course, as these gentlemen said, and they are, let's say, more experienced than me and specialized in Sharia, that the agreed upon sources are Islam, uh, Quran, and Sunnah. But when translating this book, I discovered the importance of a jihad, that is, the, the effort made by the scholar to reason and to uh, so ishtihad is common to you, all human beings. And I discovered also the importance of Qiyas. It's mathematics. How can a faqih, that is to say a jurist consult, can by analogy, uh, even if a judgment or a provision is not found in Quran or in Sunnah, he can create a, a judgment or law or a, uh, a statement, a legal statement, and also uh, the importance of istihsan, that is preference, when we have many choices and according to which criteria the scholar can choose an idea and not the other. And it's logic, it's logic. So we are connecting with the human intelligence. It's sharia is just a part uh, of the human, uh, let's say, intelligence in, uh, and achievements in legal in legal field, and uh, when we see some founding principle, why Sharia? Why do we have this legal corpus? It's to save, I think, uh, uh, please correct me if uh, I'm, because I'm not a specialist, life, first of all, human life, human reason, uh, richness, or the wealth of the, and um, uh, deen, of course, religion, faith, uh, and nascent. That is to say, generation to save, yeah. to save generation, and I think that property, yes, well, property, property and uh, uh, future generation, nothing. That is the continuity of a human uh, kind, and the importance of which he had, for example, led a scholar like Ibn Ashur in Tunisia, a modern Muslim scho uh, scholar from the Maliki school, to add a sex. Uh, objective to save freedom. The freedom because he concluded, he 
deduced from his studies, from reading Quran. He had, he, he, and he is one of the main interpreters, modern interpreters of Quran and Sunnah. And he said that before anything, the human being has to be free to choose faith and to understand Sharia and to choose Sharia and to interpret, to, to interpret it and implement it. So I think this addition is very important. It's very important that Sharia is not, let's say, an extra, let's say, uh, an alien uh, uh, inter, yes, uh, uh, legal system uh, trying to, uh, somebody try to implement or to force some people. Sharia is, of course, there is these holy sources but it's also uh, something uh, developed by a human being, an interaction between reason and faith. Reason and faith and interest of all society. I think that as far as the Tunisian example is concerned... I just want to bring you back to your... Okay. But I, what I, for a minute, just to say, yeah. if, if, if going by the statistics, they're saying that majority Muslims want to have Sharia integrated into the main legal systems, so if they're going to be majority of uh, Europe is going to be Muslim, then what, how will, what will happen here with Sharia law and traditional mm. legal systems? Well, uh, Can it be yeah, you want me to mitigate these facts. Uh, let's yes. say, oh, Europe is going to be Muslim. Who knows? Uh, uh, maybe, many uh, Muslims who are living in Europe, they will also move to another country. The, the issue is not, is the country is going to be, um, is going to be Muslim. For me, the question has to be asked otherwise. As Muslim, believing that Sharia is good, how can I use it to serve the good for humankind, for Europe, USA, Asia, yeah. our world? How to serve the common good with Sharia? I think, I think this is the, the real, uh, the, the good question uh, to ask. You know, uh, in, um, in interfaith dialogue. Yeah. I worked uh, for years and years, and what I realized is that we always need the wisdom of the other. Yeah. And let's so ask ourselves, in how can the others need our wisdom in Sharia? We have to explain it, to ex explicit it, and maybe also to rethink it. And this is very important. No, I, I just want to continue on this way. Uh, there's an argument that separation of church and state. Mm. Yet in Sharia, there's no separation of church and state. So, so, so. let me get back to here. So, how do you harmonize them in a democratic society? I, uh, I insist in, in, uh, that the uh, <coughs> Two main sources of Sharia, I mean written Sharia, I mean Quran, which is Sharia that's about 11% of all of the text on Quran, not so much. And the oral uh, Sharia, that means Hadith or Sunnah, not all of the Sunnah, but just the parts which they, the normative norms, the normative norms of, of uh, of uh, Sunnah is part of the Sharia, you know. The fact that it is not Sharia. Part of it. No, not part of Sharia. Yeah. Because, because Sharia, it is a uh, dynamic, uh, dynamic uh, movement, not a static uh, one, you know. Uh, for that, uh, I can say that the two main sources of the Sharia, we can call it uh, apodictic. Apodictic, that means that it doesn't accept any error or contradictions. The two other parts, the two other parts are uh, assertory. That means admit. Uh, why we can find some contradiction because it is a human uh, interpretation of the text. You know, for that, in uh, fact is the science of application of the Sharia. This is the question. Yes, yes. And, uh, Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm not specialist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, is, the, they complete itself. Yeah. Sharia is articulated yeah. through her. Yeah. Well, that's uh, also, it's the, 
the continuous thinking of the uh, legislative uh, cover to uh, make the Sharia more acceptable for the people. Because the application, it is not, uh, how can I applicate this? But most important, how can the people accept the, the way of application? This go also in the in the in the Jerusalem Jerusalem of Islam. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, please, please. Uh, there's misunderstood three things. Any sources of Sharia, Sharia, and fiqh. Sharia is basically based on the divine sources. Therefore, we are saying that Sharia is divine. But the fiqh is the human understanding of the divine sources. This human understanding is similar to the positive law, reality of the life, observable phenomena, and this is the reason that we can see. One can say that there is too much differences of opinion in fiqh. But another way to see is that fiqh is accommodating the human diversity and from the classical period till today each Muslim society has its own culture and fiqh has the capacity to accommodate it we are saying Sharia is comprehensive the comprehensiveness cannot be achieved without flexibility Sharia is comprehensive because it has the flexibility and it has the capacity to accommodate the changes that are continued to be in the human societies. Therefore, the wisdom, observable phenomena, and day-to-day -day changing of the life are also accommodated in the fiqh. And fiqh is not as sacred as Quran and Hadith or Sharia, because fiqh is the human understanding. And since it is human understanding, there could be differences into it. And these differences is actually diversity of Islam. Now let me just uh, continue this thing. So my question is that can Sharia be compatible with modernity? Especially yes. as we relate to when the Sharia doesn't recognize separation of church and state, but modern secular laws, the democracies, there's a clear separation of church uh, and state. I, I again like to hear uh, mention very important thing. This is a misunderstood phenomena. In many European countries, there are Christian political parties and they are participating in the elections, they are winning sometime elections and they are governing. While understanding Sharia, it is not the government <coughs> mixture of the government. Yani, politics is not mixed with religion in Sharia. Actually, Sharia is saying that politics should be guided by the Sharia. It is not the mixture. It is the guiding principles that politicians should behave properly in accordance with Islamic morality and in accordance with Islamic ethics. So it is unnecessary and it has not been the type of mixing of church with the government. There is no doubt there is a relationship that the Sharia should supervise the politics. But we have to understand at the same time that they are too different, not mixed with each other. I'm, I'm going to ask, simple, yes or no? Is there a separation of church and state in Sharia or not? Yes. Uh, there is a, there is, yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. No, yes. The, the question is not the yes or no. Yes, we have a good dialogue. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Women always have precedence. Well, um, first of all, let's take the example of the first Islamic state or Islamic society settled by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He made two founding acts. The first founding act is declaring believers, brothers and sisters, that is, Aha Baina Muslimi, brother. So on the basis of religion. But he made another act, founding act, which is, for me, it's like a pact of citizenship, the Watiqa of Medina. And uh, this, um, let's say, pact of Medina, it was a pact of citizenship between it, uh, because it organized life between different 
citizen of Medina, Muslim, polytheist, Jewish, or maybe Christian if they were Christian at that time. And they it set rules which are not rules religious of a religious theocracy. It was civil, let's say, state. And let's not forget also that the two first um, caliph, uh, Abu Bakr and Omar, mm -hmm. when they delivered their speech or when they were um, elected or let's say confirmed as caliph, they uh, addressed the, the Muslim and they told them, you are the authority to our accountability, we have an accountability towards you. We are accountable to you. And if ever we fail to uh, our responsibility, you have to, uh, to yes, to, 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 to uh, sorry, question us. Yes, to question us and even to punish if, if, if it is or sanction if it is possible. So they have not said we are here by the will of God and we will stay forever. I think that uh, the relationship between Sharia and politics is especially on the level of maqasid. Uh, why we are we doing politics? I'm doing, I'm in politics because I want to see justice. I want to see human dignity. I want to see saving a human life, saving a human reason, saving a property, and saving a new generation in a political program. So I take my inspiration in Sharia. Uh, it is really more intricate, more sophisticated than coming here as a politician. Oh, let's implement this law or this hudud with limits or uh, punishment. No, it's more general. I was asked, and I'll and finish here, by some of my um, uh, co-citizens in Tunisia, but you are denying Islam in the Constitution. I said, why? I said, because you have not mentioned Sharia as a source of law, and you are an Islamic party. I said, but please, reread this Constitution, giving social and economic rights. Isn't this, this the spirit of Sharia? Giving equality between citizenship, isn't this spirit of Sharia, etc. Et so Sharia shall not be confined to a set of ahkar, of rules. It's wider than that. You know, yet Sharia, as practiced in different countries, is different. You know, according to Sharia, if you commit a crime in certain countries, you can be stoned to death. But the same token, you go to the largest Muslim state, Indonesia, that's not a practice. So, there are some contradictions here. I want to ask Dr. Hekmarke that and expand also to what's the role of women in Sharia, in Iran. Before, before it, I uh, want to say, Sharia is divine rules from God. Fair, according to our professor, understanding of Fuqaha, according to the situational and circumstances of country and to the according to the methodology of usul uh, al And the other uh, thing is a legal system. Legal system is part of fiqh, not all of fiqh. And uh, in legal system and in sharia and in fiqh, we define some limits, some obligations, and some freedom. Every country in the uh, in the sphere of freedom and the combination of the forbidden and obligation have some experiences. For example, uh, we have. Uh, some general principles about, about the property. We respect the proper property uh, and the contract that uh, help to uh, intellectual, contractual relationship between the people. Mm. But mm, what kind of contract and in situation how to do, how, what, uh, how do you do with this limited? It is experience of a person, not fair, not sharia, but experiences. 
For example, economics, scientists say something. For example, Islamic banking. Islamic banking is uh, according to some limited and some principles, general principles. But every country, according to their situations, uh, make a uh, institution such as Islamic banking. In Iran, uh, for changing the faith to legal system, have some institution. For example, uh, in Majlis Shura uh, Parliament, uh, take the faith and change into the law, and uh, some jurists, Islamic jurists, uh, supervisor of it and control it. Yeah. But this uh, But this way, we change faith to law, according to the situation of Iraq. Mm -hmm. In Islamic law, there is no difference between four One law. And I want to come back to the Islamic banking, very important question, but just on the role of uh, the rights of women in Sharia in Iran. Tell us something about that. Okay, we ask questions. You're asking all the questions. We'll, we'll come back. We have, a, we have a format which we are following. There, there's a reason for it. Thank you. We need to participate in this also. Yes, they've given me some guidelines on that. Okay, about I'm following that guidelines like in the morning. About women rights, we should distinguish between terms. Some rules in Sharia and Fukaha uh, refer to Sharia and understand it in the name of faith. But uh, the relationship and the rights of women is uh, not all of rights of women is not uh, according to faith, but uh, some of them according to uh, customs, uh, cultures, and the others. In every country, we are Muslims, but. The principles we believe, we act upon it is not Islam. Some of them are customs, are according to our culture. For example, uh, Iran is uh, such. Some of the rules governing the uh, behavior of women and rights and duty of women according to the faith and Sharia. And some of them according to the culture, Iranian cultures. Um, when we uh, want to discuss about the uh, women's rights, we uh, should have a methodology. Without methodology, we cannot discuss about it. According to the uh, principle of Islam, um, the principle can, we can understand the principle as a whole, not separate of them. For example, if uh, we can understand the principle of heritage, heirs, we can understand some other principles of Islam. One of them is not, uh, one of them, if we can understand one of them, we misunderstand. You know, even though the format is given, but I want to respect what the audience is saying. I'll deviate from my format, uh, especially because post 9-11, there's a whole different understanding of Sharia and Islam. So, I, it's up to you. Raise your hands. You'll be recognized. The mic will come to you. Please identify yourself and keep your questions brief and so that more and more can participate. Okay, I begin here. Please, give the mic, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. Um, it's on. It's thank on. you very much for this excellent presentation. I have a question for Professor al -Hab. Um All the peoples of the books are defined by their law, the Jews, the Christians, the Muslims. And I was interested that you compared Sharia to uh, national sovereign laws instead of to other uh, theological laws or 
I don't know if you would describe halacha necessarily as a theological law. Um, canonical law is certainly theological. But um, the laws of the peoples of the book typically have a sort of federalism principle that allows them to, um, people who live in a land where they're with other groups of different religions will respect the civil law, which is what uh, the professor, professor Mullah said, that's right. So I, I was curious about your analogy because I felt like um, part of the confusion that arises about Sharia is that it's typically characterized as being analogous to nationalist laws instead of to the laws of the people of the books, which many people around the world understand the role of that law in people's lives and don't find it threatening. So I, I wonder if you could comment on, yeah, on the, uh, the propriety okay, of the analogy. Let me just take a few questions. Gentlemen there, who, who, we change the format for him. Thank you. So please, get into him. Identify yourself, please, if you would. Uh, my name is Dawood Sultanzoi from Afghanistan. Uh, I also want to be educated, so that's in the context that I'm asking the question. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, first of all, my understanding, at least in my own country, is that uh, when we speak of Sharia, and when you ask questions about people, what kind of uh, system you want Sharia, they, they, when, you, when they hear the word of Sharia, they, they literally go to the meaning, not to the context that is being discussed in a in a, an academic fashion. They say, okay, Sharia means the rule of uh, land, land, Islamic Islamic uh, uh, jurisprudence, that's all. So they don't see it, uh, since they don't speak Arabic, and most Islamic societies don't speak Arabic, a uh, majority of the uh, Muslims, they look at it in, in a literary fashion, not in the fa academic um, uh, fashion that uh, is being discussed here. So that, that's something that we need to pay attention to. Uh, the second uh, thing is that uh, Mr. Professor Ziaul Haq said that, uh, uh, of course, we all believe that uh, Sharia is divine and divine should be flexible. And flexibility is uh, in the hands of the interpreter, right? Yeah. So, uh, in today's Islamic societies, with the Taliban in Pakistan and Afghanistan uh, interpreting Sharia in one way and uh, uh, Muslims of Tunisia interpreting it in another way, uh, and Emirat of, of Islamic Emirat of Taliban compared to the Islamic Emirat of, uh, of the UAE, they're uh, vastly different. How do we reconcile these things without going to anarchy in, in, in Islamic societies? Uh, this is uh, this is going to be difficult to, to reconcile. So, uh, as a Muslim, I'm back. Yeah, my personal capacity, so I don't speak for the World Bank, I just wanted to make sure. Um, I think that I, I want very much to agree with you that, that you know, uh, Islamic Sharia, Faith, or whatever it is, else it is because I, I agree that many people don't know all of these very fine uh, distinctions. It's all about morality. But what concerns me very much is that in every Islamic state, there is a high degree of corruption. Well, Which is high, and I, I quote today, Reuters today says that corruption has worsened in most Arab countries since their 2011 revolution, even though anger with corrupt officials was the major reason for the uprising, according to the public opinion. And actually, when you look around the world, in every Islamic state, the more Islamic they are, the more corrupt they are. The more, but, but these very same Islamic states are the ones that are the first to go and, and attack women's rights. So how can I, even though I'm a Muslim, how can I sort of like in a way find a, a middle ground that on the one hand, morality is not being really followed, but on the other hand, the moment that the Sharia comes in, in, into, into place, it goes after attacking women's rights. So I would like to ask this question from the, from the panel, and thank you very much. Sorry. Okay, that, you know, there are a few hands up here. Let me go to the lady there. Hi, Susan Hirsch from George Mason University. I want to pick up on something that Professor al Haq said. I'm wondering what we can learn from situations where we have a very diverse religious population and we have perhaps a Muslim minority community using Islamic law. And I'll just put on the table the example of Kenya where there are had these courts that have been in operation for quite a long time, and those are in the context of the civil and criminal 
uh, Kenyan uh, secular system. Can we learn from those examples to answer the question of what will happen in the future that, that you've uh, raised? And are there other examples that we might put on the table as well? You know, these people are phenomenal here. They are, they are noting down all these questions. Went here, they'll answer each one of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Stefan from the University of Hamburg. Yeah. I would like you to connect uh, what do you have to say about Sharia law to the topic of the conference, maybe to the rule of law? Exactly. Um, and may maybe one or two observations on this. First, um, I was amazed to hear that Sharia law is only for, for Muslims and it's not relevant for the others. Of course it is. If you just remember the discussions on the Egyptian constitution, there was months and months of discussion yeah. on Article 2, whether Sharia was the only source of law the dominant source of law, the primary source of law, one among many, and of course, then it enters into into a secular law. So I, I, I think I don't I don't buy this this point. And the second point is, um, for me, the rule one probably the most important aspect of the rule of law is that um, people are treated equally. Now I would like you to deal a little bit with this, uh, especially with regard to to women. I mean, if I look at the Quran. Obviously, this is not the case. Uh, so the question is, to what degree are Sharia and the rule of law um, compatible? If I look at the uh, World Justice Project results, and I look just I look at the number of uh, Muslim countries in the world, then I must then my impression is that overall, uh, regarding the rule of law, they don't fare very well. Okay, Colin, yeah, just continue, just give the mic behind. I'm coming to you after this. Hello, my name is Kanan Dhru, I'm from India. My question is that there are many societies across the world which have religious and traditional practices um, which are going on and that are often in conflict with the mainstream law uh, that we see. So I wanted to ask the panel if they see um, whether Sharia can put some kind of light to these kind of traditional and religious practices in other countries and in other religion and whether we can follow suit. So would there be any parallels that you can draw on that front? And Professor al I wanted to ask that you said that uh, Islamic law, I mean Sharia law and the mainstream law should be integrated, there should be harmony uh, that can be created and that could be the way going forward. What do you see as challenges um, in doing precisely that in the coming years? Thank you. Uh, first of all, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Amal Lanur Sani. I come from Afghanistan. <coughs> um, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, the Taliban regime in Afghanistan was one of the main reasons why the whole discussion about Sharia law, acceptable or not acceptable, came to the mainstream media and the world got to know about it. Um, and it was exposed, and of course it was at that time very, very extreme. Um, so pertaining to that, and that was the only type of Sharia law I was ever exposed to, um, I believe, I'm Muslim, that worship uh, and spirituality is between God and the human um, directly. Whereas Sharia law enforces that upon you by making you uh, pray five times a day, making you fast five, uh, whatever, 30 days in a month. <laughs> and making sure that you are um, following every code and conduct of your worship. Now when Quran itself says, La iqraf al-deen, whereas there's no compulsion in deen, or there's no compulsion in religion, why does Sharia law interfere directly with a person's spirituality and theology? Number one. Number two, um, compatibility of Sharia law. What, and, and Sister posed a very good question, uh, the last question is what are the major problems? And I feel that the major problem is trying to justify chopping off hands and stoning a woman to death in the modern society. If fiqh uh, is an ever-evolving thing, how do we evolve or get out of this? Whereas we're compatible with the rest of the world. I think that's, those are one of the main issues and I would like for uh, all of you to uh, shed some light on it. Yeah. Thank you. Here, just here. Hello, my name is Radia Hennessy. I'm with the Benita Foundation, and uh, thank you so much for this panel. I think uh, whoever had that idea of doing a panel on Sharia law had a brilliant idea, so thanks so much. And, um, thank the World Justice Forum. Yes. <laughs> uh, and I've uh, 